During the late 2020, there were multiple media reports of mysterious monolith sightings in the United States and Europe. Though we heard the media reports, but we really did not know the details and the truth about those sightings. What was important was that it sparked the topic of extraterrestrial life and the impact of the extraterrestrial beings on human civilization and society. Archaeologically, monoliths can be any upright structure. However, the shape of the monoliths according to those media reports were similar to the monoliths shown in Stanley Kubrick's 1968 film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Undoubtedly, 2001 A Space Odyssey has been the most discussed, analyzed, debated and reviewed film in the entire history of cinema. It does not need any introduction from me, but for me and for the thousands of other film lovers, this has been the most thought-provoking film that we have ever seen. Apart from the groundbreaking visual effects, way ahead of its time, the narrative, the editing, the production of 2001 made new heights and standards for modern filmmaking. But this film is indeed beyond those technical heights, beyond those technical achievements. There is a lot more in 2001 that is not limited to the typical universe of science fiction movies. There cannot be any definite explanation of this film. All the scenes of the film are open for different interpretations by the viewers. For me, whenever I watch this film, I get some kind of spiritual vibes. Generally, people get that feeling only during the ending scenes of the star child. But I could sense the spirituality throughout the film. I could never really explain these feelings before. But recently, I came across a new concept that changed my perspective of watching and understanding 2001. This concept is related to time and more precisely the cycle of time. Some of us have heard the term yugas which is a popular concept in India. According to this concept, the time is not actually linear. It is actually cyclical, but the cycles are slow and huge. The yugas are huge periods, generally spanning hundreds of thousands of years. It is believed that there are four yugas, Satya, Treta, Dwapara and Kali. The majority believes that we are right now living in the worst part of the cycle, which is Kali Yuga. After hundreds of thousands of years of Kali Yuga, there will be some kind of apocalyptic event to end the Kali Yuga and to start the Satya Yuga again. Now the new concept that I recently learned is about the idea of short yuga cycles and according to this concept we are not living in Kali Yuga. We have actually gone past the Kali Yuga and are now living in Dwapara Yuga. We will come to these details later. Now, since I learned this concept, whenever I watch 2001 A Space Odyssey again, I could see the similarity of this concept of yuga cycles and the events that are shown in the film. In this video, I will try to analyze the film from this perspective. 
and we'll discuss some scenes which directly and indirectly proves the point. Also, I'll discuss my take on the meaning of the black monolith as shown in this film. Before the first part of the film, the dawn of man starts, we see two and a half minutes of black screen. We see nothing in the screen, but we can hear a eerie complex music in the background. At first, I thought it is just a brilliant tool used to settle down the viewers and make them ready for what's about to come. But once you see the entire film, you will find that this music was used three times in the entire film. First, before the dawn of man, then during the 13 minutes of interval with black screen, and again during the famous Stargate sequence. The musical score that is used here is Atmospheres, composed by Hungarian composer Gyorgye Ligeti. In fact, Kubrick used four musical scores of Ligeti in 2001. He used Kiri from Requiem during the three human monolith interaction scenes. He also used Lux Aterna in the scene while Dr. Floyd and the team were traveling in a space shuttle to visit the Clavius monolith site. And finally, Kubik used Avengers after the end of the Stargate sequence when Dr. Bowman had entered the neoclassical palace room in the park Jupiter and beyond the infinite. Ligeti's music plays a major role in understanding 2001. The structure Ligeti used in this course, he himself termed as micro polyphony. I recently heard a speech on Ligeti's micro polyphony by musician and composer Fiona Lee Jones, where she says micro polyphony is a compositional technique that involves overlapping of many musical lines traveling at different tempos and different rhythms to create a tone cluster. Now the question is why Kubrick made the artistic decision to use the micro polyphony during the key moments of this film. This brings us to the concept of creation and evolution. And yes, everyone would say that this film is about evolution and is about the survival of fittest and so on and so forth, which I agree. But those are on a surficial level of the film. Behind all those evolutionary lips, there is a deep underlying play of time that is described in the film. If we consider the dawn of man to be the birth of human civilization, then what was before that? The apes, the marine life, the microorganism? Yes, definitely those were there, but Kubrick used jump cut to leap between different stages of human evolution in this film. After the detailed scene of tool discovery by Homo habilis species, a single jump cut was used to leap to the space exploring super intelligent Homo sapiens species. It was the transition from the dawn of man part to Dr. Floyd's story. Similarly, we can imply that Kubrick used the jump cut from two and a half minutes of black screen and atmosphere music to the fast landscape scenes to start the dawn of man. And he skipped the microorganism, the marine lives and the apes before Homo habilis. So in other words, the black screen with atmosphere's music is indeed Kubrick's interpretation of the time before the creation of the universe. 
the epic sun moon earth alignment shot with also spark sorathrusta establishes the fairy moment of the creation of the universe from ancient times different religion philosophy and science try to understand what created the universe and what was before the creation of the universe in ancient indian scripts of rigveda there is a specific hymn for the creation of the universe that is called nasadiya sukta it goes like this nasadas nosadas ityadyanin nasedrajo no vyoma paruya किमावरीव कुहक शर्मनम अंभ किमासहनम गभीर न मृत्युरासीद मृत न तरी न रात्र्यान्न आसी प्रकेत आनीदवात स्वधया तो देक क्वेश्चन before 3000 years and how this knowledge is heard for common man to grasp in today's age but there are several scholars in east and west who try to explain and share this knowledge i'm just borrowing from them so here in the first two lines the question is asked that what existed when nothing was there before the creation of the universe and the answer is given that only the super consciousness or god that existed now coming back to the film if the black screen and the darkness of 2 and 1/2 minute is kubrick's interpretation of the time before the creation of the universe then the background music of ligeti's atmospheres is the cinematic interpretation of that super consciousness that existed even before the creation of the universe this theory also matches with the micro polyphonic pattern of ligeti's music if the super consciousness is the only existence before the time then it is indeed the source of all creation and hence it can individually identify and connect to each and every consciousness and when realized as a whole it is a cluster of all consciousness which is exactly the nature of micro polyphonic sound maybe i am trying to oversimplify the nature of super consciousness but we all heard that it is something that cannot be explained and cannot be described only the greatest minds like kubrick can dare to venture on the concept of super consciousness and even create a cinematic representation of the super consciousness by showing the dark screen with micro polyphony kubrick showed us the infinite existence of that super consciousness and when there will be interactions with human kubrick showed us the super consciousness in the form of the black monolith again with micro polyphony music yes the black monolith is indeed the representation of that super consciousness which existed even before the creation which exists now 
and which will exist after the end of the universe. Based on this theory, there is no extraterrestrial or aliens involvement in this film. It's the usual genius of Kubrick who made it open for the interpretation. Now this will bring us to the motion of time. Is the motion of time linear like we perceive in our daily life? To simplify, we think that there was a time when the genesis or the creation of the world happened and then gradual advancement of beings took place and finally there will be some kind of apocalyptic event that ultimately leads to the destruction of everything. A linear motion of time from beginning to the end. Though we have been taught about this linear motion of time in ancient Greece and in Indian philosophy, there is a concept of cyclic nature of time. And based on this cyclic nature of time, there are change of human consciousness collectively. In Greek philosophy, we find the concepts of golden age, silver age, bronze age, and iron age which is similar to the Indian concept of the Yugas. Those are Shatya, Treta, Dwapara, and Kali. Though the Greeks do not tell what will be after the Iron Age, the Indian philosophy says there will be again a repetition or cycle of the same four ages. That is, after Kali ends, the Satya will again start. Among these four yugas, the Satya Yuga being the enlightened highest point of human consciousness and Kali Yuga, the dark rock bottom. Being an Indian, I also grew up knowing that we all are now living in the dark age of Kali. This Kali Yuga started 5000 years ago and it will go on for 432,000 of years and then an avatar will prevail who will end this age and start the golden age of Satya Yuga. This concept was too deep for me and I will not be living that many years to see all those great events. So I was not very much enthusiastic about this long yuga cycles. But recently I came across some new concepts which suggests a very sensible approach to this yuga concept that is the short yuga cycles and it says the doomed Kali Yuga which is supposedly prevailing right now had already ended during the 17th century. This concept originated from the book Holy Signs by Sri Yukteswar Giri. He was the guru or teacher of Paramhansa Yogananda. In the introduction part of the book, he introduces this theory. He says that there won't be a Satya Yuga coming right after the end of the Kali Yuga. Instead, there will be an ascending cycle of Trapara, Treta and then the Satya Yuga in the exact opposite order of the previous descending cycle of Satya, Treta, Trapara and Kali. An analogy can be made with anti-clockwise and clockwise motion of the wheel of time with this descending and ascending sub-cycles of Yuga. Each of these Yugas will be multiples of 1200 years where Satya Yuga will be the largest consisting of 4800 years and Kali Yuga will be the shortest with 1200 years. In addition, there will be periods of transitions from one Yuga to the next. Now from 11,500 BCE to 500 AD was the last descending cycles of Yuga and the ongoing ascending cycle started at 580 and will reach the highest point of Satya Yuga 
during 12,500 AD. Hence, based on this theory, the Kali Yuga part of the first 1200 years on this ascending sub-cycle has already ended during 1700 AD. To summarize, there is no linear motion of time and the time is always cyclical in nature and the cycles consists of two ascending and descending sub-cycles similar to anti-clockwise and clockwise movement of a four series yugas. Also, based on these yuga cycles, the evolution of human consciousness, intellect, achievement and reach are defined. During the Kali Yuga, the human civilization will be at the rock bottom and during the Satya Yuga, there will be the highest achievements of human consciousness. This concept also makes sense to address the questions that how can different archaeological wonders of the worlds were built in the ancient times? How can greatest philosophical texts like the Rig Veda itself was written long long ago during the 1500 BCE? For more details on the Yuga cycles, and corresponding human achievements, I would recommend the book by David Steinmetz and Joseph Selby. There is also a five-hour session available on YouTube by Boris Fritz about the Yuga Cycles, which cleared a lot of my confusions on this. Now coming back to 2001, the appearance of the first monolith brought forward the usage of the tools among the hominids, which helped them find new sources of food and conquer lost lands near the essential resources like water. When you look closely, Kubrick also hints at the leap from quadrupedalism to bipedalism before and after the monolith interaction. We can clearly see the Moon Watcher's character standing firm on his two feet during the attack for conquering Lost Land, where most of the other hominids were still using some part of their hands to balance the weight. From the recent anthropological studies, we know that these bipedal human ancestors were either Australopithecus or Homo habilis species who existed around 3 to 2 million years ago. We also know the first of our kinds of humans, that is Homo sapiens, came around 35,000 BCE. So when Kubrick cuts from the Moon Watcher's ecstatic joy to Dr. Floyd's space rocket arriving moon, he leaps more than 3 million years of time. And for the continuity, he uses the famous bone throwing in the sky by Moon Watcher. The bone first moves upward in the anti-clockwise motion and then cuts to the clockwise upward motion and then clockwise downwards and then the scene cuts to a moving space rocket. Kubrick used this anti-clockwise and clockwise movement of that bone to represent the cyclic nature of time and the yugas during this long period. Kubrick also gives us multiple hints of the cyclical nature of time and four yugas within each cycle when he shows the double wheel shaped space station rotating in anti-clockwise and clockwise direction viewed from different angles and having four axes in each wheel. He also showed the cyclical movements of astronauts inside the spaceship discovery. We hear Kiri from Requiem during the scene of Moon Watchers 
and Dr. Floyd's interaction with the moon monolith. During both human monolith interaction scenes, we see the monolith, sun and moon alignment. This specifies and signifies the knowledge of the universe passed to the human through the monolith, the super consciousness. Both interactions initiates another leap in human evolution. In the dawn of man part, it was the discovery of tools and the progress from quadrupedalism to bipedalism. In the case of Dr. Floyd, it is the step towards deep space exploration by humans. Also, this alignment shot emphasizes the fact that the super consciousness that we talked about earlier is not only the source of all creation, it is indeed the agent for those evolutionary leaps and manifested here by the monolith. Moreover, if the monolith is the agent of evolution, then the likes of Moon Watcher and Dr. Floyd are the chosen ones who would lead and guide the leap in human consciousness and achievements. The Moon monolith was literally waiting to be touched specifically by Dr. Floyd to be activated and give the signal towards Jupiter. Same for the Moon Watcher shot. We saw that a lot of hominids touched the monolith, but it was the Moon Watcher who actually discovered the tool. And then he was the one who led the attack on the other clan. And he was the only one to stand firm in his two feet. This brings us to the most important character of the film, Dr. Dave Bowman. Similar to Moon Watcher and Dr. Floyd, Dr. Bowman led the steps towards next human evolution by reaching Jupiter's space. But Dr. Bowman was destined to do more. He was the one who led the Discovery spaceship traveling towards Jupiter. He survived and was able to neutralize rogue super intelligent computer Hell and drove his space pod through the stargate directed by the Jupiter monolith itself and reached beyond infinity. Now, what is this beyond the infinity? What was that stargate sequence all about? I'll again go back to another ancient Indian text to explain the stargate sequence. In the ancient Indian epic Mahabharata, in the part where the Bhagavad Gita is told, we come across the concept of Vishwarupa of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna was the representation of the super consciousness in Mahabharata. And Vishwarupa was the cosmic form or the universal form of the super consciousness. This form cannot be visualized or perceived by the normal human. And to be able to visualize that form, a special kind of cosmic vision was needed by the human Arjuna. Hence, Arjuna went through a state of consciousness called Samadhi, guided by Lord Krishna, the super consciousness himself. After receiving that vision, Arjuna was able to visualize hundreds and thousands of cosmic forms of the super consciousness in various shapes, sizes, and colors. The state of Arjuna was the doorway to the infinity where the human mind can actually perceive the super consciousness. Similarly, in the film 
Once the spaceship reached Jupiter's space, Dr. Bowman started his pod, which went completely into the control of the monolith and was guided through the stargate. The stargate images shown in the film were similar to the Big Bang theory of creation of the universe. There were various forms of matter and lights of different colors. During the stargate sequence, the shots of Dr. Bowman's face were deformed and his eyeballs were exposed to see different forms of lights. From this, we can conclude that Dr. Bowman went through that state of Samadhi and finally perceived the knowledge of the superconsciousness guided by the monolith. The interesting thing in this case is that during previous human monolith interaction scenes, we saw the monolith sun-moon alignment. But here, we did not see that alignment. In this case, instead we saw the monolith and Jupiter and its moon's alignment. And then we saw the monolith guided the pod through the stargate sequence. This clearly shows that in previous cases, it was kind of activation or the initiation of the progress of human beings. But in this case, it is actually walking the path towards that higher knowledge and hand-holding by the super-consciousness towards enlightenment of Dr. Bowman. During this target sequence, we heard Ligeti's atmosphere, which at this point needs no further explanation. At the end of the stargate, when Dr. Bowman's eye color became normal, we see that the pod had entered a palace room where we hear Ligeti's adventures. After some shots, we see Dr. Bowman had came out of the pod and he looks much older at least 30 years older. Considering that he was no longer inside the spaceship, he was in the pod, it is unlikely that he actually spent 30 years in the pod through the stargate sequence. Here, Kubrick is brilliantly showing that the knowledge that he has gained during the stargate it is just his body reacting to it and becoming a much wiser version of himself. The neoclassical palace room with lighted floors where Dr. Woman finds himself after the stargate can be described as the reflection of that enlightenment of his mind after stargate. The distorted versions of Ligeti's adventures can only be heard while Dr. Bowman was out of the pod but still wearing the spacesuit and breathing oxygen from the cylinder. The sound had an uncanny similarity with the sound that we previously heard during the Dawn of Man sequence while the hominids were communicating with expressions and when no language was developed. When Ligeti made adventures, he stressed on how the music can overcome the boundaries of language and he tried to capture five different human tonal expressions corresponding to five different human emotions. Now at this moment, Dr. Bowman has experienced something which no one has experienced before. He has seen what none has seen before, at least in his yuga. His body has gone through deformation and transformation. At this moment, certainly 
he has gone beyond all worldly human emotions he has seen the secrets and wonders of the creation of the universe so all the earthly matters are just distant fragments of memories or sounds in his mind which will be gone once he gets out of that space suit with earthly oxygen hence there is this distorted version of ligeti's avengers again brilliantly used by kubrick interesting fact is that kubrick was so determined to use avengers in the scene that he didn't even care for ligeti's permission to use avenger which later become a copyright issue and it was settled mutually now coming back to the concepts of yogas it is believed that while the collective consciousness of the entire human race progresses according to the progression of the yuga cycles the individual consciousness can still progress to the next levels faster while the body remains in the previous yuga this can be achieved by practicing meditation and yoga and moving towards the realization of super consciousness this is how many enlightened souls have been there in this world even in kali yuga in the film the part jupiter and beyond the infinite shows us the journey of dr bowman to travel the path towards that realization if we try to fit the timeline of the film into yuga cycle frame we get the first two and a half minutes time as the time before the creation of the universe then we see the famous shot of earth sun moon alignment and here the thus broke zarathustra which we can consider as the moment of the creation of the universe then a jump to the time of human history when the evolution from homo habilis species to homo erectus species took place with the guidance of super consciousness which we can consider as a change in the yuga in that ancient cycle this was around 2 to 3 million years bce then the story cuts to the common era and we see a futuristic world where a video call can be made from space station just by using a pay phone we also see in this time the moon travel has become very convenient and the technology is almost ready for super intelligent computers going by the theory of yukteswar if we are currently living in dwapara yuga then dr floyd's time will be the end of this ongoing dwapara yuga which will actually end with dr floyd's interaction with monolith in the moon clavius base hence the part jupiter mission started in the next yuga which is treta yuga the interesting fact is that every yuga will have a theme of its own and according to this concept the kali yuga theme is rules and boundaries the dwapara yuga theme is energy the treta theme is time and satya theme is soul this means in dwapara yuga there will be significant discoveries related to the energy and at the end of dwapara the technology is related to energy which will be a part of common man's life were completely unknown in the previous yuga of kali similarly by the end of treta yuga humans will be able to better comprehend and understand and use the time it is still a question 
on how much depth human would be able to understand time whether we will be able to go back or go or move forward in time like a time machine we don't have the consciousness enough at this moment we don't have the consciousness advanced enough in our yuga to understand it but kubrick gave us some glimpses in the film when dr bowman came out of the pod in the palace room he was able to see his future self and consequently in that future when he was eating he was able to see his further future state of dying age so dr bowman was able to ascend towards the next cycles very quickly as he was guided by the monolith and traversed through the stargate towards enlightenment in the final sequence of the film we see dr bowman on his deathbed interacted with the monolith and become a star child this is living his human body and becoming aware about his enlightened soul exactly what will happen in the satya yuga in the next shot we see that the star child is traveling in space and looking at the earth the obvious way to interpret this is just to say that the enlightened soul is coming back to earth to help human progress towards higher collective consciousness however there is another explanation kubrick never showed us if the star child is really coming back to earth which is in the physical sphere or bhuloka or if the star child is just looking at the earth in its way towards different spheres or hiranyaloka like other scenes in the film it is also open for our own interpretations i will end this analysis here there are still a lot of open topics in 2001 for example the significance of super intelligent hell computers in the film maybe i'll try to analyze that later in any other video i try to touch different ancient wisdoms like the yugas vedas and mahabharata in this analysis which i would highly recommend for everyone to learn this analysis should not be mistaken as a promotion of any particular religion as i strongly believe that these are ancient wisdoms which were conceived and written in higher yugas before us and soon enough the entire human consciousness would be able to relate to these concepts in their own ways i am grateful to my friend gaurav for making the beautiful nasadiya sukta chanting for this analysis i use some of the images to help the viewers understand the topic the video may have become a bit long as it is a vast topic and i thank everyone who has watched it till the end thank you